um, the idea about, about peace is um, you get into that box, the idea is to come out in one piece. <laughs> Oh, this great feast, and you wanted everybody there, and everybody being the wind and the stars and the trees and, and all of the elements that are at the feast, except, um, except the members of this one family. So that passed on, and the next day there was a continuation of the lacrosse game. So we're talking prior to the earth itself, the game was being played. So when they say uh, the creator's game, we're literally talking about that. And then the story is long, about Spider-Man coming down to this ball of water, which was the earth itself, the land. Beaver trying hard to, to find a place for her to land, and, and all of the bird nations were holding her up on the wings, and, and animals were, water animals were trying to find the land. And a muskrat goes down and finally gets enough dirt in his mouth and paws, but uh, dies in the effort, but floats to the top and has it. And so, Beaver tries, he said, put it on my back, maybe I can do it. And when they tried, he said, no, I can't. And that's when the turtle said, let me try. And they put the pad of land on his back, and he said, yes, he said, I can do it. He said, it will grow, and I'll grow with it. And so that's how began the earth, and that's why the uh, sky woman had a place to land. And it goes on. Long time. 
this is a long story on both ends. So what I'm telling you here is that when you hear about that game, it was being played out there. And then one more um, side of that. Much later on, several hundred years ago, we had a, um, a visionary who, who really saved the uh, Confederation. His name was uh, Kenyon Dyer. He was a uh, Seneca chief. And he was taken on a, a journey, a spiritual journey of four days. And uh, during those days, which are amazing days to be recounted, and there was a fall, we hear these four days recounted in our longhouses across the Six Nations. And a lot of things that you would be interested in being said. But right at the moment, there was a, a moment when they were coming into the village. And there was a Tom Fryer moving about the village and he was telling the people what was going to happen. Today, there's a game, there's a lacrosse game today. And these are the captains and we call the names. And Kevin Dyer said, that's my friend. I said, yes, he'll be here today. And so, for the players, when you pass over to the other side, you're going to be a captain. And you just continue the game. So it's much more than to hear. It's not a fairy tale. It's much deeper than that. It ties the cosmos to ourselves. It gives us a spiritual relationship that helps us who work on Dog Lake and to understand the relationship between ourselves and the earth and, and the cosmos entirely. So um, that's just the beginning, and I'll turn it back to you. Well, I'm not going to be too uh, steeped in the lore of the game. I, I've heard it many times, and I believe it, but I think. Um, I do uh, know factual history about the game that I got involved in. And it goes back to uh, about 1830, when uh, Canada, uh, Canadians, uh, protector of uh, the UK and the English, um, witnessed uh, the mobs uh, coming from the woods and playing this game, uh, which has an Indian name to it, or an Indian name. Chiquais. That's just bumping hips. Uh, and it wasn't called lacrosse at that time. That was something that the uh, French Canadians put out later on. They were interested in the game, uh, fascinated by it. They weren't fascinated by what they call a savage attitude to it. Uh, the natives were a little rough with one another, uh, friendly rough. Uh, there weren't a lot of rules. There were many, many players. There was a long distance between goals. Canada was new uh, at the time. Uh, they were still attached to England, but they had nothing of their own. They had no support they could claim was theirs that didn't come from England. And they were desperate to uh, be independent, at least in a, in, in a betting a support that they could call Canadian, and it didn't come from England, and it hadn't touched the United States yet. So back in about uh, 1830, there was a dentist in Ottawa by the name of George Beers. He loved the game. He loved watching the native game. He wanted a white man to play that game, but he didn't want to play it the same way as the natives were playing it. It was a little too rough. It was a Victorian era in which uh, we were talking about being a gentleman and a, a great gentleman with one another, but <coughs> the spirit of the game, not for money, not for trophies, not for medals, just the spirit of the game. George Beers decided that <clears throat> if he could write the rules in white man's language and take the game that he saw the Mohawks originate and uh, make it more so-called so -called civilized, uh, maybe it could be called the National Game of Canada, and they could really thumb their nose at the British saying, yes, we're a protective of England, but we have a national game and you don't have it. It's solely ours. We invented it, we play it well, and it belongs to Canada. And he wrote the rules uh, so it could be played in a more, more civilized manner. It could be played in towns and not in 
fields where there are miles between goals and hundreds of players on a team. And he wrote the rules as Dr. Pierce felt they might work. Uh, a short distance between goals, some 80 yards between goals, uh, no more than 150 yards long the field would be. There would be 12 players on a team, no more than 12. Uh, there would be uh, a person on the field called a referee, which the natives did not have. And there would be no uh, tripping, biting, hitting, and, and all the things that the natives enjoyed doing in fun. And so George Beers made a set of rules, and it was picked up by the aristocracy in Canada. Uh, it was played in clubs, and it was played in a more civilized manner, and it drew great crowds and great uh, attention. And uh, so when they had uh, developed the game a little further, and, uh, they decided to go to England and, and say to the English, look what we got. This is our national game. I know, you, you know, you're protecting us now, but this is a Canadian national sport. It's called lacrosse. And uh, so the English adopted the Canadian game and the Scots and the Welsh and, and so on, and it's gone around the world. I probably shouldn't be mentioning it. Mixed company here, uh, the seventh president of the United States. You all know who that is, of course. Uh, <coughs> his name was Old Hickory. And, you know, lacrosse sticks uh, made out of hickory. It's that tough. And uh, about that time, uh, George Beers was writing uh, civilized, so to speak, rules uh, so that us uh, uh, gentle white people could play the game. Uh, there was a painter by the name of George Catlin. Uh, he went uh, west, uh, unfortunately, uh, with a group that General Jackson wanted to go west. And he watched uh, the game being played, and he, he painted and drew the game. There were no cameras back then. And uh, he wanted to sell his artwork. So when he brought these paintings back to the base in St. Louis and in New York City, uh, he embellished them. I made them uh, a little more uncivilized, like we wanted to see. He was an American. Um, and when he uh, fixed the paintings, when he came back to St. Louis and, and to New York, uh, we were all a little alarmed that this native game was played this way. Um, he chronicled uh, what happened from about um, uh, 1815 through uh, uh, the late uh, 19th century. Uh, Dr. Beers was a dentist, as I said, in, in, uh, in Canada, and he wrote the first rules and got the Canadian Parliament to adopt it as the National Support of Canada. It's just been recently that the Canadians have decided that uh, they wanted hockey included. And it's been in the last several decades that they've added hockey. They haven't eliminated saying that they invented lacrosse as we know it. And they won't say it's not a national sport of Canada because it still is what they've included now, hockey. I grew up uh, just a couple of years ago in Syracuse, New York. I was fortunate enough to uh, have a very fine coach. Uh, he also put the roof over my head and clothed my body. And Coach Seven Senior, and I wasn't going to escape the game. It was played about two miles from my house on the reservation in the box. Uh, field was played also, and they would come to the university and play uh, at the Syracuse University as the Onondaga Athletic Club, uh, strictly native. And we would go out there and exchange and uh, play their game in the box, which was really a mistake. <laughs> and, uh, so I grew up uh, in the coach's house, and I, I learned about the game. Uh, from the early 50s, late 40s, and learned how to catch and throw. Um, my biggest thrill was uh, on a Sunday afternoon, my father would put me in the car and drive me out uh, to the Onondaga Reservation, where there was a number of stick makers. And he would tell me he would buy me a stick. It was my choice. And we would drive out there. And the sticks were made by any number of very fine craftsmen and they would have them on their front porch. And like a little kid in a candy shop, I would drive along with my dad, and I'd get out and I'd look, back the car, get on the road, and I'd get out and I'd look, and, and finally, um, 
I would pick a stick. I was like a lucky kid. I bring it back to my neighborhood where everybody was playing baseball in the spring. And they thought I was, uh, and they knew I was a coach's kid, and that's why I had the stick, but they thought I wasn't going to go anywhere. And uh, it really wasn't going to go anywhere. The reason being that the game revolves around the stick, which is native, which is traditionally acquired by the natives. And they know all the secrets of the wood and the stringing, the process. It was not able to be made by machine. It had to be handmade, hand strung. And to this day, I don't know a white who can make it stick as we know it. It was almost a downfall of the game. It was the start of the game as we know it in the States and in Canada. We relied on the native for the most important ingredient in the sport, the stick. They could only make so many of them. There was an Irishman whose name was Lally, and he was a shoemaker. He came from Ireland and he immigrated to Canada. And he saw the natives playing the game, and he saw the Canadian, white Canadians playing their national game. He saw that they were buying sticks from the natives. But there was a need for more sticks because the game was getting popular. So he started the first lacrosse stick factory in Cornwall, Ontario. Ontario. And his last name was Lally. And if you played the game, you probably played with a Lally stick in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. He had a great craftsman working for him. His name was Frank Brown Point. Frank was a wonderful carver, stick maker, native. All his employees were native. He was Irish. They were native. They made wonderful sticks. And Frank Brown Point made a fabulous carver and some, some words with Mr. Lally and left the Lally factory, which was the heart of the cross in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, and into the early 50s. Mr. Round Point left and went back to his reservation, Cornwall, uh, just off the Hudson on the uh, canal. He started his own factory. And not being a businessman, being a native and not really a student as a businessman, hired a Scotsman by the name of Chisholm. So we had an Irishman and a Scotsman controlling the making of the wood stick, which made the stick, which made the sport go. Without the Lally factory and the chisel factory and the natives as a workman, the game couldn't progress. <laughs> well, the game caught fire in the United States. It was Canada's national sport, the field, and the natives were still playing the game. And there was a need. They could only produce so many sticks a year. The Lally factory gave up the competition in the early 50s and sold off to the Chisholm Cross factory in Cornwall. And they were the sole makers of what this sport needed. Without them, the sport would have died. They made 56,000 uh, sticks a year. And the game outgrew the making of sticks. No two sticks were the same. They were all handmade, so some were a little bit different than others. They were all strung by the ladies. The men would persevere very hard making the sticks from hickory. Long process that usually took about a year. Then the stick was brought home and the ladies strung them with gut and leather. So as you can see, it wasn't going to go too far. It couldn't be mechanized. It couldn't be machine driven. There was a couple of white entrepreneurs in the States who saw a business opportunity and locked up the one and only lacrosse factory in Cornwall and took 100% of their sticks so no one else could have them. And then they distributed them as they saw fit. A few went to New York, a few went to Boston. Many of them went to Baltimore. None of them came to Syracuse. We were in a market for the few sticks that were being made. When I was a coach's kid and I wanted to win the stick. I went to the reservation for a number of years because we had a limited amount of wooden sticks being made on the res. The best stick, best wooden stick in the world today is still made on the reservation. Unfortunately, it's not used very much because it's brittle, it's expensive, it's rare, it's a treasure. It's hung on the wall, it's right here, it's made in Hickory. So my dad had put me in the car and went up to Canada 
And I go to this factory, and they had some 60 or 70 natives carving these pieces of hickory. Fascinating process. We can't get into it tonight, but it's, it's a fascinating lost art. And I would wander through piles of sticks. And my dad would say, Glenn, pick out one. Pick out that stick. You pick it up, and each stick was different. You had it in your hand. A great all American lacrosse player by the name of Eamon McEnany, uh, who once coached with me for me, told me to pick out a stick was like picking out a girlfriend. And you had to treat it just as gently until it became yours. Uh, it, it was a process and a love of the wood, of the hickory that held, you held in your hand. It's also brittle. And they were unique, there were no two alike. And you broke one end. I used to name mine after my girlfriend. And then somebody'd step on it and break it, and there you were. Your game was gone, unless you had another stick. And if you were lucky to have two sticks, the other one wasn't like the first one. And it was subject to the weather, and the, the gut on it got soft and the rain and play, and the stick got saturated with water became very temperamental. We would come off the field on a rainy day, it was muddy, we were muddy and sweaty, and we were given a towel to take a shower with. You didn't take a shower first with that new clean towel. You wiped off your stick first <laughs> to save it from the abuse it had been taken, and then you took a shower, and then you used a towel that your favorite stick was uh, wrapped on. The painting I, I want, probably fascinated by this painting, because the guy looks like me. No. He's got a lot of native blood in him. You can tell by his high cheekbones. That's my father. And if you collect sticks, and I hope you don't, more for me. This is a treasure. This is like the Mona Lisa of sticks. It was done by an odd dog, his name was Lazor. And I learned on this stick, because my father had this stick when he played at Syracuse that he bought from Mr. Lazor <coughs> on the reservation. Mr. Lazor died and his craft died with him many years ago. This stick is that stick. The stick I learned on it was my father's stick. My father was my coach. My father was Jim's coach. My father was Warren's coach. That's Warren's painting. Warren did that painting in appreciation for my father's interest in bringing him from the Onondaga Res to the hill where he got a straight A record and developed his great artistic ability. And as a senior in school, painted this picture, my dad from memory, with this a lally stick and presented it to him at his you know, graduation day. So you can see this guy's many facets.
But Orrin was the goalie. This was my sophomore year. Or Orrin's a goalie, and he had just had a knee operation. He had a cast from a sky to his ankle. And he's our goalie. <laughs> he his long, shaggy pants on to hide the fact that he had the cast. So before the game, we all get around to Orrin, and we surround him, and we bring him out, we put him in the net. <laughs> This is to disguise the fact that he can't walk. <laughs> and that he's not going to be able to clear the ball. So okay, we're, we're into the game, about seven or eight minutes. Somebody gets a, a breakaway, and I'm back there in defense, and he comes by me, and he whips a shot in there, or it sticks his leg up, boom! <laughs> It hits the cast and goes up past midfield. <laughs> and the guys, oh my God, the guys got a wooden leg. <laughs> so from that time on, they, they stopped the game. And Roy's father says, well, he's our only goalie. What are we going to do? So they put like a thousand pounds of cushioning around the cast. So Orrin looked like, you know that Christmas tree story where the little guy in the snowsuit falls down, can't get up? That was Orrin. So that was my first day. But I've learned to respect what happens in the cross. What the teamwork is just so fantastic. And the stick, the only reverent experience of my life just about was when we went down to pick out sticks. Roy's father brought me down to the reservation and I was going to pick my own stick, you know, because I could back up fast and I could knock people down. So I'm going to get my own stick, you know. And it took so long to get used to it, to be able to cradle a ball and throw accurately and do all the things that seem second nature now to everybody. It was quite a trial, but that experience of owning that stick, and I took it everywhere with me. If I went on vacation, I'd take my stick, and I'd create a lot ball, get used to that. So I did that for years until I could finally catch and throw the ball a little bit. But I really envy these two. They've been connected with lacrosse their whole lives, and they can talk to any, any end of it at all. And all I know about it is what it did for me and the pleasure I derived from it and how much fun it is to watch it today because it's much more sophisticated and smoother but it still has that rhythm, that beautiful dance and the kinetics of, of an athlete connected to this little apparatus, that little stick that does so much and gives us such great pleasure. And the other, there's two halfbacks on the team. The other halfback is a guy named Jim Brown. <laughs> and he played lacrosse also. But he had a stick before he had football. So he played it better than any of us and better than anybody's ever played since then. But we were all teammates, Orrin, myself, and Jim, and, and the kid named Jim Brown. Getting back to the stick that uh, was so important in the game, and, as the game gained popularity and more people wanted to play it, you couldn't get a stick, you couldn't go to a sporting goods store and buy a stick. And if you found a stick, it probably wasn't a very good one. And it might break. And it looked like the game was going to die, it wasn't going to progress. And uh, this is a, a stick from a, a 19th century. It's called a Great Lake stick, and it's played singly uh, long before the other two sticks I showed you. And that's how it progressed from this to that. This is a, well, these are called Choctaw sticks, and these date about 1790, and they're played as pairs, and Choctaw uh, is uh, in Mississippi. Uh, the other one around the Great Lakes, these were played in the Mississippi area. They're still playing this game, and you got the ball and the stick and protected with the other stick and ran, and ran for your life. <laughs> to think that we went from this to that, to that, which is very difficult to catch and throw with. 
and it was, the sport was going to die because it was too sophisticated to buy the one thing you needed. You could always buy a baseball net, you could always find a bat, you could always find a football, but you couldn't always find a cross stick. Little known fact that, you know, people often wonder why the, uh, the Basketball Hall of Fame is in Springfield, Massachusetts. People think it should be in Indiana and Kentucky. The Basketball Hall of Fame is in Springfield, Mass. The reason being a Canadian who learned his national sport came down to Springfield, Massachusetts to take a job at the YMCA in Springfield. And uh, bad weather there also. And one spring, when he was eager to get outside and couldn't because of the weather, he decided to train the lacrosse team in the gymnasium where they did tumbling and boxing and track. And the small space was stale in a hurry. So he decided he had to keep the interest of the boys up as a team playing fix and brushes and in all the phases of the game except for the goal and the distance. So he said to the manager one day, you know, we're going to have a cross practice in the gym today. Why don't you go down to the local market and get a couple of apple boxes and bring them back to me. I'll tell you what we're going to do. So the manager went down to get an apple box, two apple boxes. And the manager said, I don't have any apple boxes, but I got some peach baskets. Well, they do. Well, the manager didn't want to disappoint this Canadian transplant. So he gave him two peach baskets and he brought them back to the coach and handed to him. And the coach said, where are the boxes? And he said, I, all I can do is baskets. So they hung them at either end of the gym off the balcony where the track was. Happened to be 10 feet high. And he got a ball out like a volleyball. And when the lacrosse team came to practice that day, he said, guys, no sticks, no lacrosse ball today. We're going to play with a bigger ball. We're going to pass to one another pretending it's lacrosse, and when you get down near the goal, that's the basket, the peach basket, throw the peach basket, see if you can score. So they thought it was kind of a novel game, and they did that, <laughs> except the basket would catch the ball, and the manager had to get a ladder out. <laughs> Finally, the coach, after the second or third day, got smart and took the bottom of the peach basket. So when the ball went into the basket, you could see that it went through and it dropped back, back down the floor. And they go the other way. Well, the town of Springfield I thought this was fascinating. Game was the cross coach had invented, and they were calling it basketball. So the town people came up to the gym to watch the lacrosse team practice and watch this Canadian run the practice. And they were more fascinated by the inside gymnasium and preseason game than they were anything else going on. So it developed from that. It's called basketball. It started at Springfield College by a Canadian transport, a transplant that came down, as many Canadians did, at the turn of the century. And very often I tell my friend Jim Behan, if it weren't for lacrosse, you wouldn't have a job. <laughs> This is a two-handed stick from uh, from our great books. Uh, it's a little addition to that, depending on who's playing up there. Uh, this is uh, Alfie Jock, who's out. Alfie, you're here, where, where are you? And uh, this is a Benedict stick, and Frankie Benedict from uh, Alfie Sussney. And you can see, can you see it uh, feels different. They both, they both, they both, both could stick, and um, of course, goalie sticks, which is my, um, this, I used to cut these uh, handles off at my elbow, I had a very short goalie stick, I uh, played, played with one hand, basically. I could pass, I could get down the field, and um, the way they, what Ridge was talking about here, we developed into a, a pretty good team, and uh, the best, you know, you, you remember a game, you know, you say, what, what game do you remember? Every lacrosse player here will pick up a stick, remembers a game or two special games, you, you just don't forget it for one reason or another. This one, 
I remember once um, we were playing Army. That's, uh, we were playing for, for two undefeated teams in the nation, Syracuse and West Point. And it was head to head because uh, they had a hell of a goalie on the other end. Uh, I had to respect that man. He was tough, tough goalie, uh, Ray Rickett. And uh, I was in on this end and we were head to head up there. This was going to be the last game in Archibald Stadium. It was the last game. And uh, we had, of course, luckily we had these big guys over here. And, uh, Billy Brown. Billy Brown was playing, you know, played for the Boston Patriots. Um, the Red Sea. Anyway, it was uh, a bad start. <laughs> it was a bad start. We, I forget what it was. I think, I think the score at the half was uh, five and two. Uh, Army had five and we had two. And uh, I remember the coach looking at me. First shot they took when we went right in. All right. Not very much on another one. First thing you know, it's five and two. And in those days, the defense was tough. It was tough to get in close, tough to get your shots. So that's why the scores were down, especially these two teams. And uh, anyway, at the half, my coach says, he says, you know, I know the move of every man on this team, he says, and I know exactly what they're going to do before they do it, except one. You're looking at me. And I said, don't worry, coach, don't worry. I said, we're going to take it to him. We're going to take it to him the second half. Well, he says, got that out better half. He said, it doesn't matter now. This is, you know, this was the game. And uh, so the second half starts out, <clears throat> and put your boots on because it's going to get deep in here. <laughs> so, second half starts out, and the face-off starts. Big army. Those guys look like they were cut out of a cookie cutter. You know, all the same size, thick and so you could hear them when they're coming down. Probably, sound like horses coming. And and took the face-off, came down, and 15 seconds later, the score was. Six to two. <laughs> we, we had just started the second half and we were stopping it. And I see Coach looking at me like that. Don't worry, Coach. We're okay. Everybody's looking at me at that time. Anyway, that was the last goal they made. They didn't score for the rest of the half. I mean, it was, it was, we didn't beat them until the last four minutes of the game, I think. It was like six and six, we were climbing up on, but I guess the backbreaker was they took two or three shots before, I don't forget what it was, quite a few at me, and they were taking the rebounds off, and I was like, where the hell is Riggs, you know? And he's over there to the side, you know, he's got his stick, and the ball hit in front of the crease, and I hit the ball on the side of my stick, I went right into his stick. Right into his stick, and then I saw this going on. It's a cradle, cradle like this. <laughs> He's running down the field like a rooster. <laughs> but I, I fell out. I went right down like this, you know. And all I could see was that mud flying off his cleats, and he took that ball down like that. I think it was two passes. It was a, a seven six. And we scored another one for good luck and we beat him by two goals that day. And that was a game that I remember, but I think the thing that I remember most was Coach Blake. You know, at the end of the game, his face was the color of a shirt right here. I, I, I never saw a color on a man's face like that. And I went up, shake his hands, and nice game, Coach. I'm smiling. He's not. You know, Army coach. And uh, what, a couple of a couple weeks later, we died. And I think uh, tough game to lose. <laughs> now, the, then the interesting thing about this is that I had the privilege of playing with Warren, our freshman together. And Jim and I played. I played together in the field. 
I tried my hardest, really. And uh, years went on, and Orrin graduated and was an artist in New York. Jim Ringo went on to the West Coast to play in the NFL, down to Dallas. And they left me behind. So I became a cross coach. I didn't really want a job. <laughs> <laughs> I went through trials and tribulations, as all coaches do. Good years and bad years, good games and bad games. Good experiences and bad experiences. And the story stretched. I stayed in the game a long time. I stayed in the game over 40 years. And I heard a lot of stories. And I used to hear stories about people who witnessed the Army game that Arthur was in and Jim was in and great Jim Brown was in. And people would pontificate about these guys, these great athletes, and all the heroics of Jim Brown. And they never mentioned my name. <laughs> <laughs> and I said to a guy one day, You were fortunate enough to watch Ridlon and Lyles and Brown. It must have been a great experience for you. He said, you won't believe it, Roy, how great it was. I said, do you remember me? <laughs> I said, why should we? I said, I was on that same team. <laughs> uh, my mother had my clippings on the refrigerator back home. <laughs> I could have talked to my mother, she would have told them I'm good at <laughs> Stories, stories stretch, but this story is real. In the 1950, with the game of lacrosse, the National Game of Canada, white man playing it, We're trying to play it like the natives, but not quite as well. The natives have kind of retreated to the box game, not so much the field game, and the field game was what we played in the United States. <laughs> we played it thanks to a lot of Canadians that, that came over the border to the United States, and they coached and played on club teams all up and down the East Coast, Long Island, Boston, Syracuse, Canadian players, they knew the game, they taught us the game, and uh, the, the game developed, and I went down south, and it was a gentleman's game, a Victorian type of game. And uh, the Ivy League schools picked it up at the turn of the century, Yale, Dartmouth, uh, Columbia, Princeton, I shouldn't say that, Cornell. They all had the cross, and then as a result, all the fine boys' schools, they all wanted to go to the Ivy League school. They all played it. So by the 1910, all the New England prep schools and down on Long Island and down around Baltimore, the private schools, they all wanted to play Hopkins as one of the first teams to pick the game up from the Canadians. And it grew and grew, and there was a problem. There wasn't enough sticks. They weren't attainable. <coughs> so we had a terrible fire up in the Cornwall Reservation in 1956. The factory that made the essence, the heart of this game, burned. And it looked like this game was going to die with it because the craftsmen were not motivated and they were not into entrepreneurs. They loved to hunt fish, occasionally in a beer. They just were not interested in rebuilding and being able to bring the number of sticks up to what the market demanded. So a couple of very clever entrepreneurs picked up my idea that I had because I was a sculptor major. Uh, it died. I was like the guy that invented seven up, or I invented six up. I didn't invent seven. Up. <laughs> I went to Dupont when I was in school with a fiberglass stick that I made in my father's basement, and I asked him if it was possible. And there was some engineer down there who said, "Forget it. It'll be too costly, and you only sell one stick to somebody who never break, and you never have another sale. And the game's too small." So uh, I quit. About four years later, there were two gentlemen in the deep pockets in, in Baltimore. And they went down to DuPont and said, what can you do? The sport's going to die if we can't help it. And that's when the plastic or urethane stick was invented. It comes out of a mold. It's almost indestructible. If it does have a problem, you pick up another one that came out of the same mold. So it wasn't. Your girlfriend broke her leg. You know, it was it was replacing. And then from that, competition got keen in the United States. Not keen in the United States between an outfit called Brian in Boston, who wanted to capture the sports market, and an outfit 
in Baltimore called SDS, and they wanted to capture it across the market. And they got very competitive, and they created better sticks, and better handles, and better stringing, and went back and forth, and the game gained by their competitiveness. And when I took over as head coach at Syracuse in 1970, when I blew my first whistle, the team came out. Half of them had a wooden stick from Canada, the Cornwall Reservation. Half of them had a plastic stick. And who was going to win out? Well, the plastic sticks would break and they were subject to weather. And in 1971, three quarters of the kids had plastic sticks, and a few holdouts had wooden sticks. And by 1974 and 75, you couldn't find a wooden stick anywhere. Number one, they weren't being made in great numbers. There were pockets of makers like in, in Buffalo and a few makers in Canada. And the Jacques family out of the reservation made a handful of beautiful handcrafted wooden sticks. But why buy something so fragile and so ephemeral as a beautiful hickory stick when you could pick up a plastic stick and a woman in hand? Then, as the generation went on, the plastics got better and the kids got smart and they started to tie dye them with their school, with their name, with their logo. And the stringing, we gave up on the gut, which was subject to dogs chewing on or whatever. And we used nylon. We eliminated the animal factor in the stick that was so important back then. Now it's all synthetic. The handle doesn't have to be wood. It can be this. This handle is a 21st century invention. It's Kevlar and titanium. Kevlar is what protects our police force. Bulletproof. And, and titanium is what we send to the moon. The handles are a combination of Kevlar and titanium. Very light. The stick is done with urethane. You can dye the stick, as most kids do. It's fascinating to dye a stick for your school club. And then you can string it with any number of different kinds of synthetic. It could be shoelaces, it could be nylon. Today, you can even buy a bamboo handle because it has some flexibility to it. To think that we went from George Beers, 1820, and George Catlin, the artist, with a wooden stick and the meaning behind it and the, the love behind it and the talent behind it to make it. So today, you can buy a plastic stick, a metal handle, anywhere in the United States, all 50 states. And as a result, the game is grown by leaps and bounds. You can play with a wooden stick today in the field game in the United States or the field game, the national game in Canada. But it's a little bit heavier, a little bit harder to handle and subject to crack and break. So you'll very rarely see a wooden stick. If a kid today could handle a good hickory stick and play the American field game, he'd be a scourge because it hurts so bad he checked with it. <laughs> <laughs> I tested it. I never played with plastic, I always played with wood. And, and it's interesting. Uh, this is called the helix. All, all the plastic sticks have a name. This is the newest one. We've gotten to the point where it's gotten so sophisticated, like this stick. When you get the ball in there and you get a big athlete like Jim, you can't get the ball away from him. As a result, our game got a little rough because we have to get rough when we get them to spit it up. So we've gone back to the drawing board and we've gone back to the early nature stick and said, you know, we can't have it pinched and narrow and too deep because the game is getting violent and it's a Victorian gentleman's game, actually. <laughs> so this, this is the newest, and this is called the, uh, the Professor. <laughs> and it must be three inches across, it must be three inches high, and then it can be six inches at the top. And if you go to a lacrosse game, you see those zebras out there, they can randomly check sticks with a ruler to make sure it's 40 inches long or 72 inches long. And that this is six inches, high school six and a half. And then they measure it in here. And if the kid goes wading through everybody, he gets knocked down, he gets up, he still has the ball, he goes in and fakes and scores. 
first thing that official will do is go over, measure. Is it three inches? Three inches up? Is it six across? Is it four inches long? So it, 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 we put rules in the game, you know? You can't hurt anybody. You're not supposed to hurt anybody. You can't take a run and start anybody. It's not like the game that came out of the woods, that the Mohawks brought out of the woods, and we very rudely call it a savage game. It's a gentleman's game, and I'd like to thank you for something like you can buy the professor or any other number, there's probably 20 or 30 different heads on the market. They're not made for one position. This is, you can play attack or midfield or defense with this head. That's another thing that's improved the game. So we pump these things out of a mold, it probably cost a couple of dollars. This head, as you see it right here, is $50 for the head alone. The handle's a hundred and some dollars. It's still cheaper than a ball glove. <laughs> then you buy a package with a stringy, and you can add to that and subtract from that. And these boys, they're amazing. It's like they can't tie their shoes, but they can string this thing. <laughs> <laughs> I remember when I was on the dance team, we all had the old Native American stick with a gut. It's like what you buy at the hardware store for your dog on the sidewall. We had leather, which dogs also love, it's skin. And we were going to Dartmouth as a team, and we put all our sticks in the baggage car on a train, and that's how we were going up to the Pullman. And we got to Dartmouth up in Canada, New Hampshire, and we opened the baggage car, and the rats had eaten all the innards out of all our sticks. I can vividly remember playing catch in my front yard with a few of my neighbors that wanted to play with me. Because everybody played baseball. And I can remember my mother calling me in from bed. And I put my stick down, and I did what she told me to do. I went home and I went to bed. And I come down the next morning as the sun came up. We go out and get my stick, and all the netting would be gone. In the evening, somebody ate all the innards on So you can see how the game has progressed. The love of the stick, I, I still love it with the stick. But a year ago, I took one of Alfie's beautiful wooden sticks and I went out to the circuit University of practice. That's normally what I, I don't do. I don't go to practice. I did this day, I was curious, and I brought that beautiful stick right there, Alfie's stick. And I walked out and we have 50 kids playing with us at practice time. And I stood there as they practiced and they came up the sideline to get water, take a time on whatever they did, and I stood there well, that wooden stick, and that one kid asked me what it was, who made it, who played with it, or could they touch it, and walked right by. So that's all happened here over the last hundred years. But we should never forget its origins, and where it came from, and who invented it. I'll tell you, don't bring that type of word to a medicine game. <laughs> Diapers. <laughs> uh, or you brought up an interesting point. Uh, I know, Jim knows, uh, Professor knows. Tell us about a medicine game. Well, the, the whole purpose of a medicine game, the reason why it began actually, was to uh, play for the welfare of an individual, uh, an underdog, or any one of the people who lived there can call for a game. And, um, and once they do, then a whole uh, the whole nation kind of goes into uh, gear because first of all, uh, you know, somebody has to go and tell the players if the game coming, get your stick, and that means one of these can't play that uh, because there's instruction that goes with this because this uh, this begins with a tree. This is a tree, and all the trees, and and so. Um, the, the sides are picked by, by the clients, long house, one house, two, or they can pick it by age. And if the old guys against the young guys, they always like that one. <laughs> and, uh, and we will play it for an individual, or it can be played as we do the first game, uh, the first medicine game in the spring is always played for the players. Anybody who's going to pick up a stick.
Uh, we're playing this game because it is, you can't get hurt in this game. But in the, uh, in the medicine game, then once it begins, then it's a feast. It's, it's medicine. <laughs> so everything has to be done the same day. And the ball has to be made the same day. And actually the ball is the medicine of the stick. But the stick is the instructor. And what goes with it? And the gut and the deer, they're all in this. They're all together on here to help you. And so that whole discussion goes on, the instruction goes on to the players and prayers are made and so forth. Remember what I told you about the first time that game was played. And so that whole discussion goes on and, uh, and then back to the old style, which is too close. And the ball is thrown up in the middle and the game is on. And, uh, game is usually played to uh, an odd number, three or five. And some of those three gold games can go on for three or four hours. Uh, it's played full tail and all ages play. You see some old guy, where's Herb there? I remember Herb was out there not long ago, you know? And Herb and I were the same age. And um, he scored. And he got the ball, he knew where he was. He always could score. God was a good score to get in the ball, you know where he was. And sure enough, there he was. He had to be 78 at that time, I think. Is that right, Herb? Somewhere around there. Anyway, uh, all ages. They can't let it get too small because you get run over in there. Gets, as he said, it gets, gets pretty rough, but you know, the rules are simple. Play fair. What's the name of that coach? Syracuse. 23? Uh, 23. In 1923, you were coach. Lori Cox. Lori Cox. Lori Cox. Cox. And uh, he said, always, always got the um, doctors to come up and play because that's how the boys saw stick in this time. When you see Indians play, it looked like magic and I had that stick. I mean, that's how I grew up. I grew up, uh, my, my heroes were those guys that were playing in the box and watching them all the time. And the field, they played the field. Box across relatively new. Uh, 1930, 1928, somewhere around there, started. And, um, but it turned out to be, uh, uh, well, today, you know, 18,000 people in for a box game. Um, but during those times and those players that uh, I knew, family names, you know, family names if you're up in, uh, if you're up in Mohawk country, then you know, you hear about the Benedicts and you hear about the Round Points and you hear about all of these very famous <laughs> families and, and uh, your, your grandson's going to be playing one of the Round Points. You know, Lions is going to be out there playing one of the round points. And that's the way it goes. And, and uh, the Lays, you know, if you go to Cataractus and, and you're going to talk about the Lays and you're going to talk about the different, very, very famous um, dynasties, I would say, of, uh, of Indian nations. Right now, you're going to hear a lot about Bhaktus and now you're going to hear a lot about Genesis and uh, Thompson. Those are all famous names of famous families, and, and they have, uh, you know, when I was a kid, we were playing up in uh, Mohawk country. That was pretty good goalie, you know, for a kid. And uh, we were playing against uh, Angus Thomas. I heard a lot about this man. He was a legend, and he had killed several goalies, and, and they had been banned from the game. And, uh, and so, I heard that, hey, I heard his anger's going to play. Yeah, yeah, good idea, bring him on. <laughs> and so uh, we went up there and, and our, our box team, you know, the dirty dozen, you know, about 12 of us or 10 of us who were up there, we'd, we'd play. And um, it was a good game. We were playing down in the uh, Hogansburg box. And we were managing, we were, we were winning. And, uh, my brother Lee was out there, and, and uh, Leroy, Leroy Shen was playing. Um, um, 
tooth, you know, your dad was playing. We had a heck of a hard team, a hard, we were a hard-nosed team. Anyway, score was ahead, and we had about, maybe about four minutes to go in the game, we were hit by maybe three goals, and those days, you know, to score a goal, you had to get through that defense, and you had to work your life to get through there. And, um, anyway, I see Angus, you know, it's a hard shot, you could hear him coming, it's sizzling when he's coming. But, you know, I was handling him, and then I saw him wind up in his up middle, in the middle of the box. And my brother Lee was in the way, and I said, Lee, get out of the way, get out of the way, Lee. And Lee just flipped backwards, got out of the way, and I see, uh, I see Higgins take that hop, skip, and a jump, you know, and that uh, the underhand shot. And I could hear that ball coming, and it was flat, it was flattening right out, and it was coming. So I had two chest protectors on, two baseball chest protectors on. And it hit me right here because I said, well, I'll just stuck my chest off. Bad move. <laughs> Bad move. Next thing I knew, I was on the ground and the ball was spinning there. They go in. They go in and spinning there, you know. I didn't have any wing, I couldn't breathe, but I packed that ball again, went over here, and the ball went up. And, um, that was how I remember. You know, I'm not saying I know they poured water on me. And, and again, the only goalie. I had four minutes to go in the game. And, uh, how do you feel? You finish the game? Uh, give me a minute, I say. <laughs> Trying to get my win, you know. Jeez, I can feel that where you get up here. Anyway, uh, they give me about 20 minutes, then we took a break. Okay, let's finish the game. I got it. I was worth two cents. They scored three goals like that and they won. So Angus come over after, you know, we're upstairs in the chain and he just hold it. You know, he says, give it up, you're going to be a good goalie. He says, did you get hurt? Nah. <laughs> <laughs> I, could, I still couldn't hardly breathe. Well, it turned out, <laughs> turned out he broke two ribs for that shot. <laughs> and went through two chest protectors. Um, well, we got to be good friends, and every time that I went up there after that, uh, first thing we do, drop the lacrosse stick and pick up the fish poles, and we go out there and fish every time. I think we're running out of time, and I'm positive that some of you have questions you'd like to ask Gordon or Roy or myself. Uh, question here. When they used to play the game, uh, how far apart was the goal? What was the size of the goal? And what was the average distance to the field? I'll uh, say two or three hundred years ago. A lot of Well, there's variations. You know, some of those uh, fields were two miles long. And then the goals were uh, probably at the, at the best, maybe 10 feet, but even less than that, somewhere around that. And it depends on how high the, the stakes were, and usually it's high enough to get your stick. That's, that, was your, that was your goal, you had to get between them, one way or the other, any way you could get through. And then, you know, there was a game that was played up in Kakawaga, oh, 1735, and that was played in the arena by the Pegasus. Um, five men, five Frenchmen against three Mohawks. I tried to even the game up a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was played in small. So it, it could go from that side to that side, how many you wanted to play, so for a lot of uh, wide variety. And they played the game that they were talking there, and Choctaws and Chickasaws. And, Thousand, thousand men out there. So different all over. Complete almost straight across. Some form of it, all across. But the lungs that came, that the lungs that air acquired. Hey, well, in, uh, in about 1860, George Beers made those rules. They put 80 yards between goals and pulled them into the team, which negated all the native rules. Any men, many number of men in miles between goals in the size. And the first person to get three goals won. 
And they were a little bit of a dandy, they were Victorian, and they wouldn't allow the natives to play in the games. And the National Game of Canada initially was played by clubs in Quebec and Toronto, Montreal, and they were white, and they were Canadian, and they couldn't let the native play because he was too good at it, and too hard at it, but he played too hard at it. And so they excluded the people that had been in the game, excluded from the game for a number of years. Jim Brown, when he was in high school in Manhattan, out of Long Island, he uh, pitched no hitter baseball. He ran track. Uh, he obviously played football. He averaged 30 some points a game in basketball. And of course, he played lacrosse. It wasn't like he picked it up when he came to school. He was left handed and right handed, ambidextrous, which nobody was back then. And he's questioned a lot. He does a lot of sports talks and a lot of, like, Tonight. And because he played all those sports and he plays scratch golf and he's a great tennis player, he's just a natural athlete and a winner. They asked him what his favorite sport is, and he always says lacrosse. And the only reason he went on to the NFL was it was a living, and there was no living in lacrosse. Two easiest guys to look after. 
and uh, but we did we did uh, um, come away. He came away with uh, with the undefeated team, 57, and, and we came away with uh, an education and with friends that uh, last the way up to right now. Friendships last forever. And that's uh, we got now. I should say this so everybody remembers that um, about four years ago. Chester of Syracuse University um, opened up the, the uh, a scholarship for any Onondaga or Six Nation um, student who could pass the entrance exam and um, room board and tuition. And so that was about four years ago, and we have about 140 kids up there now. speaker at the university a few years ago. So he has an honorary PhD in Syracuse University. They all, there is also a dormitory named the Orange Lions Dormitory at Syracuse University. So he's come a long ways from a little kid on the rest. Mm -hmm. 